pay tribute to our latest dumbass. R. Kelly, take it away. I believe I fly. I believe I touch the sky. I never get late every night and day. I best in dwelling in my mammy stay. I believe I saw This episode of Reaching Out to the Unfamous is brought to you by God. These nuts. And welcome to the most selfless, honorable show on YouTube. This is Reaching Out to the Unfamous. And we've got a good one for you today, man. We've got a vlogger who tells it like it is in the form of Styx Hex and Hammer 666. We've got a really talented artist on DeviantArt. And we got another talented artist on Fur Affinity. As well, mind you, as another popular YouTuber who isn't really popular. I say he's popular because he speaks unpopular opinions and they've become popular now. But anyway, back to the point. Sticks Hex and Hammer 666 talks of Mike Alive and Adi, who is now in very deep shit, if you get what I mean. And and you know what's funny? You know what's funny? It's it's also gonna be a double feature in this particular segment, because a friend of mine named Steph Dumas on DeviantArt, her her last name is Dumas, but a Dumas, she is definitely not, because she's not stupid like the people in politics. She's smart. She knows what's what, and that is that. You know, she, she makes this quote right here. By the way, the Deviant posted that one about Michael Avenatti and Caillou, who have some similarities. I wonder if I've entered into the Twilight Zone? And of course, I come up with my own reply with that. And I compliment her for, for that excellent freaking journal. And, and because she featured one of my deviations in her in her latest journal, I figured, why not feature her in my latest episode of Talking to Myself News, as well as Sticks Ham as well as Sticks Hex and Hammer 666 in this episode of Reaching Out, right? Take it away, Sticks Hex and Hammer 666. Lay the lay the freaking freaking Okay, hold on, hold on. Lift the smackdown on Michael Avenatti's ass! Alright everyone, you might hear some clanking in yes. the background that's not actually from my coffee. What's that mysterious noise? It's prep for Thanksgiving uh, dinner, basically. Uh, usually holding it several days early here, uh, essentially to beat the rush. It's just pragmatic, it makes sense. Uh, so yeah, there's like, you know, squash and shit being uh, prepared, beets for tomorrow. Uh, all the stuff that you don't do same day, like the turkey and stuffing or the fresh bread. Uh, we got to talk about, though, uh, something important here. I figure I might as well show off that I still have this, because it you know, might come in handy. Just change the date, put a little piece of paper on the bottom of it, and I'll tell you why. Uh, when I'm looking at the democratic field, it's not looking too good at the moment. It's still basically, people are still fantasizing about Hillary Clinton running. But one person I can tell you would have a total joke of a campaign if he actually registers and files and and runs for real is Michael Avenatti. Uh, he's had a slew of bad luck recently. Um, significantly bad luck. For instance, he, it was found that he owes, oh, what was it, like two million or some crazy sum to a former employee that had been underpaid for a while. And he doesn't have the money apparently for that. Now, uh, because he can't pay the rent at the place that his law firm was, which, I mean, how many tens of thousands of dollars a month in rent, are you being charged for this location? Like, how many, how big an exactly. office do you need if you're basically, you're a self-branded individual. You probably have several law clerks and some assistants and stuff. You, you probably don't need a whole building. 
I would think you just need like one compartment of an office building and that would be like Avenatti Law Firm. I could be totally wrong. Maybe he has like a hundred employees. Uh, but you must have, I mean, being charged almost a quarter of and a million dollars in non-payment of rent, suck his dick. That's, pretty, uh, that's pretty expansive. And I can't imagine that the person who uh, runs the building there and, and collects your rent wants to tangle with you anyway, because of course, what does Avenatti have a pension for? Suing people. He's a fucking lawyer. Uh, a very <laughs> seemingly opportunistic one now, that likes a lot of limelight. So if he could have a public fight over his rent, his rental agreement or something, I'm sure that he'd be more than willing to. So that's a fairly bad uh, few weeks for Avenatti. And then, of course, you of had course, him being every week is a bad week by the Avenatti. LAPD on suspicion of domestic assault. Uh, he's claiming that's not the case. And, and here's the thing. He wasn't arrested. He was brought in in the normal sense for questioning, essentially. Basically on suspicion. They haven't charged him with anything. Um, if that's the case, that they never end up charging him, TMZ could actually <laughs> legit be in some trouble from him. For defamation, uh, of course, they, they you know the corporate media defames people all the time. So it's interesting to see someone who's basically you know the number one opportunistic never Trumper hashtag Basta at the end of every fucking post. It's funny to him to see him get actually targeted by libel for once. <laughs> interesting to see it uh, aimed at something other than the alternative media. Uh, or against, you know, some Trump super fan within politics or something. Or Trump himself in some cases. Like when they were speculating upon what his handshakes meant, it's like, what the fuck? You know, go back to actually reporting news. Uh, but Michael Avenatti, if, if I had to hazard a guess, looking at this string of unfortunate events, is he going to be in a position, even fiscally necessarily, to actually be able to launch uh, a true presidential bid? You need no, an enormous amount of money. Or at the very least, a very strong grassroots network. He doesn't even when have I look the at the polling involved in, you know, who do you want to run against Trump in 2020 as the Democratic nominee? Avenatti is basically just a blip on the radar. Now, he's nowhere near exactly. the top 10. He's not even in the top 20. Exactly. He's got less than 1% of that core of support. Now, that's not necessarily to say that that makes him one of the worst potential candidates. Hell, when I'm looking at the list, I'd put him somewhere in the middle in all honesty. He would still have a better shot than Biden. He'd still have a better shot than Clinton, who probably Speaking at that point which, has be anybody able to stand up, uh, judging ordered her arrest and, and prosecution now. yet? Bernie Sanders can't really run. He hasn't filed the paperwork necessary to rejoin permanently the Democratic Party. I don't think they because would he's an him old if he did. Sack of beans. And he probably knows this. It's like last time around was his last hurrah. He's like fucking 74 at that point. You know, yeah, this 78-year-old man is going to go toe-to-toe -to, -toe to Trump in regards to the energy related to campaigning. Yeah, and his message his was very, very revolutionary. An early 1800s era Marxist message uh, re basically hashed around and changed a little bit to turn it into a bleeding heart social platform for modernity that you then peddle to kids like your fucking diabetes-causing ice cream buddies do. Reach it, man, yeah. I don't think yeah. actually going to work. Avenatti. All things considered is a bit more on the pragmatic side. The problem, here's the thing. Avenatti is a more transparently opportunistic persona than like a Hillary Clinton or a Joe Biden or something. But don't let them fool you. They basically are the same thing. They try to get attention for free publicity. They are corporate pawns. Uh, they don't really care about the American people. They're, they're you know, exactly. fucking shifty people. <laughs> they all you are. are yeah, that includes a lot. Of, uh, I'll say yeah. this. One thing I like, uh, Tim Pool actually was talking about this the other day. That's about right, the only, uh, uh, I mean, fuck, I, are, I always fucking forget her name, and I have no idea why I mix it up with Naomi Cortez. Uh, Alexandria Casio cortez uh, is basically ripping the Democratic Party apart. She's actually spending most of her time at the moment trying to supplant the corporate Democrats. By the way, I wish her well in this. <laughs> I think she's way out in left field. I would never vote for somebody like her for any office, but... Yeah, uh, as long as it collapses the Democrats. See, the, the thing is, you should hope she's successful. I, I would say this to all the business Democrats. Yeah, back the far left on this one. Let them collapse the party and make it unwinnable in 2020. Because the amount of social pressure will allow you to then reform it. The far left will have failed. The corporate Dems are on their way out. Bring in the business Democrats. You can migrate back from the Republican Party. Restore economic sense. Get off of some of the, the shitty wedge issues, you know, mo you know, white people are bad sort of pa campaign style that you have in yeah, some of man. these circles. Uh, you know, limit taxation. Hey, maybe we maybe we should go back to being more anti-war, anti-surveillance state, anti-police state. 
Why are why are some Democrats jumping aboard the more religiosity morality bandwagon? Yeah, uh, the party's got definite problems. Avenatti's not the man to reform it. <laughs> Avenatti came out. Well, where was he giving the interview? Where he basically insinuated that uh, it would be best if a white male was leading the Democratic Party. Now, he wasn't they, there. They actually, That's the thing. I, I'm going to side with Avenatti on this one thing. I know that sounds terrible to a lot of the MAGA people, but I, I got to I've got to take exception to one thing uh, in regards to this. They made it sound like he was saying this in a gleeful manner. What he was pointing out is actually very true, which is pragmatically course, speaking, a white male is capable of leading the Democratic Party because there are a lot of it. people who specifically, on any economic or social issue, they side with the Democrats. But if you put someone there who's going to ramble about how they've got a vagina or how they've got black skin and so you must vote for them or there's something wrong with you, that will turn off literally millions of those business class voters. The, the, the working class and middle class sort of union question. style Democrats will not support the party and will pile on the Trump bandwagon in droves if you try to harangue on wedge issues. I've said this for years in maybe more coherent terms. He's not fundamentally wrong. They did twist his words. And I don't think that when the corporate media does that, it doesn't matter if their target is themselves a slimy person. It's still wrong for them to twist their words that way. And make no mistake, it's because Avenatti happens to be a male and white that they did that. <laughs> of course they did. Uh, they're opportunistic. If they can score cheap points off on him, they'll do it too. And he's, good, he's quickly going to learn a lesson that the corporate media that has been his buddy for the last 15 minutes of his fame loves to kick people when they're down. They're going to pile on him they're, 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 with the hashtag Me Too, with the mom, maybe he's racist thing. It, it's, oh no, he's unelectable because of these things, so just forget about him. They are going Absolutely. to smear him into the mud. Now that he, he's tripped and fallen into a puddle. You know, he was he was the king. Walking down, he had his crown and his scepter and his robe and everything. He's walking down his, his fucking red carpet to the great fanfare of the corporate media for the moment. Now somebody else is emerging with their own crown and their own scepter and their own cape, and they're strutting down, and he's sort of off in a gutter. He's fallen down, and the only pictures that are being taken are basically his mud-covered ass. And that's going to continue happening. He's going to learn a hard lesson in this, that no matter how powerful he thinks he is, politically or socially, he can be ground into the mud by these opportunistic, uh, they're basically like a bunch of vultures. They're going to gather around and pick at him now. Uh, and if he becomes if he becomes a political corpse with zero relevancy, they'll keep picking at his most. Oh, the presidency that never was. What ten reasons why Avenatti was not the man for the moment and stuff like that after heaping praise on him during the Kavanaugh trial and with Stormy Daniels. Because they were only praising him because of his opposition to Trump. Well, uh, opposing Trump, my goodness, half the country does that on a daily basis. Absolutely. Some of these people literally th foment insurrection on a daily basis and talk about how wonderful. They LARP about Hillary Clinton's alternate timeline presidency. They have whole blogs that where it's like like fake news stories like, like if Clinton had been elected. How oh, she right. would have reacted to this situation as opposed to evil, small-handed Trump. Yeah, Avenatti really got in over his head. He tried to extend the 15 minutes of fame, and like usual, it uh, didn't work. That's about all. Yeah. Peace out. You're absolutely right, Stick, Sex, and Hammer 666. You know what's good, and that's all that matters, man. Keep rocking it, brah. Yeah! And now we're going to move on to someone else. Let's do it! Somebody tells me I'm going to die. Snitches get stitches in other street lessons. <laughs> I swear to God, this is this is genius. There's this guy from iChive called DJ Pellets who made this joke of a Dr. Seuss cover. And I love it! <laughs> look, at this, look at this niche! Oh my god. I could just imagine it now. Everybody ganging up on Shepard Smith at Fox News. Speaking of which... I'm such a fucking savage! I'm a savage! Oh my god! Oh my good god almighty, man! What, what in the hell? What, what was I on when I, when I edited this DJ Pellet cover? 
Oh my god. Wow. I just... Oh my god. I, I still cannot. Greg Kelly is a Grinch. <laughs> and Shepard Smith is the Sneech. Appropriately. Very appropriately. And, and what about Tucker Carlson over there showing us Greg Gunther's heady work? <laughs> I swear to God, man. This is straight up freaking savage. Oh. Oh my God, man. Wow. I wonder what else is new today, huh? Nothing. You loser. I'd like to take a moment also to introduce you to this artist from Fur Affinity named Valexon. This artist in particular, of course she's a furry. I'm a furry too. I admit it wholeheartedly. I'm a furry. Nothing wrong with being a furry if you know how to control it. Many people who are furries don't know how to control it. Luckily her and I are one or two in this case and a very slim majority. So, thank God for that. Meanwhile, this picture in particular of two of her characters, or actually, I don't, I don't know if these are her characters or not. Let me look. Let me look. But several of her characters, Husky and Rotsky. Apparently, this was her idea that her husband and I actually collaborated in making that they make dog sonas of themselves. Namely Husky, her husband, and Rotsky herself. So Husky and so Husky and Rotsky are essentially herself and her husband portrayed in furry form. And you know I, I actually find it really, really original. I find that I find it so original in fact, it's it's almost something straight out of a playbook. Straight out of a movie. You know, you have this brilliant idea that you want to make a character that, that well, your spouse approaches you and, and he comes up with this brilliant idea or she, or depending on what gender you are, it's either your husband or your wife, but still, your, your significant other comes and asks you about the idea of making yourself and your significant other and what that particular pairing would be like of you and your significant other as furries, right? Now consider this. Consider this. I want, I want you guys legitimately to understand this, okay? I want this to be noted. Alexan and her husband collaborated on this idea, right? Husky and Roski. That's basically her and her husband in furry form. Now. Despite the fact, despite the fact that this concept's been used many times, there's something so original about this that it just begs me to say that this is pretty much done right. Legitimately. You can't make this stuff up. It's done completely right. Everything about it is right. And it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, look at this, man. Look at this. Straight up. This is pretty damn good, man. Legitimate. Not even gonna lie to you, it's completely legitimate. It's completely lit. Like a freaking boss. She's got that lab on point like a boss. When you lab on point, right? Straight up. Man, I'm, I'm telling you. I mean, some of her other stuff is just NSW, but or I mean NSFW or whatever. But, but the only reason why I focus on this picture alone is because I don't, because there there are probably going to be kids watching this. Not that I have to point it out or anything, but there are kids watching this, so you're kid. Look away from the screen. I want to introduce you guys to my friend, Lunar Wolf Fallon. If I'm not mistaken, Lunar Wolf Fallon is an artist who does some of the most fantastic work that I've seen. 
Digitally, she's got it. Traditionally, she's got it. You know? I mean, I mean, seriously, though, think about this. Think about this now, okay? I want you to think about this. Lunar Wolf Fallon. This artist who I have not contacted in like two years, and I come across her artwork, and it is legitimately speaking some of the best that I have seen. Legitimately. Just, just based on her featured gallery alone. You know? Honest to God. I mean, for real. So let's, let's take this into consideration, alright? Okay. On the level that she is able to do these artworks, she is probably very, very gifted at it, I would believe. And considering just by these few entries alone, there is roughly, I would say, 21 of these, or actually 22, I should say, or maybe it is 21. But these 21 or so entries in her gallery, these are very nicely done. These have this concrete, verbose sense to it that just screams energy and emotion and thought. Lunar Wolf puts a lot of thought into what is done in these particular artworks and Lunar Wolf literally has it. And you know something? I'm gonna tell you guys straight up, I'm not gonna lie, her red panda pictures, I'm not gonna lie, they're really good. They're really nicely drawn. Even the traditional drawing of the horse that she made is absolutely 100%. I, I, well, I think it's digital. I, I don't know if it's traditional or digital or not. I'll find that out on my own. But basically, basically, her artwork is something that is, in my opinion, museum worthy and deserves its own place in its museum, which is specifically... This is specifically why I made reaching out to the unfamous. To reach out to artists just like this one. And Lunar Wolf's a very talented person. A very, very talented person. And I personally believe that Lunar Wolf has it. Lunar Wolf failing, everybody. One of the most talented people you might come across in a very long time. And with that, I'm going to move on to someone else. And lastly, but not least, for this episode, I would like to introduce you to the man from New York, the smartest wrestling fan in all of New York, and the man who knows exactly what he's talking about and has every single bit of proof to back it up. Ladies and gentlemen! I give to you JD from NY 206. Jerry D has been on YouTube since 2011. Watching the WWE, spending upwards of, in some cases, 12 hours every single week, a half a day every single week, listening to watching basically watching WWE commit suicide, essentially. That's what it's doing, committing suicide. And he does Let's Plays, and he does commentary on other things, and he does interviews. He, he is the announcer of an independent promotion called House of Glory. This man has it. This guy's got it. Legitimately. I absolutely kid you not, I am 100% truthful when I say this, Jerry D from New York is the shizzle, without question. He's the absolute shizzle. And of course, I wouldn't say the S word unless I had to, but whatever.
right? The point is, it is simple enough to understand. JD from New York is without question the smartest wrestling fan I have ever met or heard from or seen in my entire life. This guy exactly knows to the T how bad WWE is and he is not afraid to tell you and if you don't disagree with them and if you think WWE is good when it's the worst it's ever been not only is he going to call you out for it but you're going to look stupid in the process and quite frankly I wouldn't want it any other way and to be quite honest I don't think you would either now considering that the last two episodes of Monday Night Raw back to back were the worst episodes of Monday Night Raw ever not to mention the fact that they have broken records for all-time low viewership at least three times by my count this year alone see this is why I'm not a WWE fan anymore because WWE fans all they want to do is praise Roman Reigns they want to think he's God they want to think that John Cena is Jesus Christ and yet people like I don't know people like Bray Wyatt and the Revival are just spawns of Satan when they're really not and you know by the way the Revival have been absolutely screwed since they got called up from the main roster to the main roster basically they've gotten absolutely screwed in every which way just like every other single solitary NXT call up that has ever worked for that promotion under the WWE banner I should say and somehow Vinnie Mac has the balls to call them up to the main roster and ruin the already immense credibility that they had in NXT and then after all of this guess who gets screwed not only the call-ups from NXT but the fans as well and quite frankly what CM Punk said is right and I know that Jerry D from New York would agree with me on this he said that you know basically this company won't be better off after Vince is dead because it'll be taken over by his idiotic daughter and his doofus son-in-law and that's quoting CM Punk Jerry D and I both wholeheartedly agree on that without question and that is why I'm featuring him on this episode of reaching out because he tells it like he is he tells it like it is and quite frankly and I know that some of you may not or want to choose to accept it or whatever but basically you gotta listen to this guy seriously you cannot go without listening to this guy and listen to his wisdom because he's got 32 years of WWE fandom to back it up He's been watching the product for over three decades, and this is legitimately, as it stands now, the worst that it's ever been. I'm out. Later. Stop the hammering! It's just not easy.